And uh, in your book, you note that, you know, many Im other immigrant groups um, had their banks and they were integrated into American society. They were able to build wealth. You, know, you, you talk about how Bank of America, which is one of the biggest banks today, was originally the Bank of Italy. Um, mm -hmm. so, and so the you know, Italians and other groups were able to kind of overcome the, the demonization uh, that occurred, uh, happened to every immigrant group when they came to America. And, and uh, they became white and, and uh, were able to build that prosperity. Why was this not available to African Americans? Um, because African Americans were never deemed white, and um, whiteness um, went in sync with economic power. And so, insofar as you could be white, which is what the Irish and the Italians could do, and the Germans and um, and the Jews after the New Deal got invited, got invited to be white, you know, and they got to take advantage of the FHA mortgage loans and the GI Bill. And those were you know, huge um, bonanzas of credit and, and subsidies that went to, to create the American middle class. And the, those and they were strictly given out on racial lines. And so by then, Italians and Irish were white and they used their position of whiteness even to, you know, to block blacks um, in from the uh, collective action power. So Irish and Italian that were involved in, you know, the industrial north and the unions um, were able to you know, work their way into the union ranks and to make sure that blacks were never involved in the unions. Um, so blacks lost their ability to, to even um, join forces in collective power. Um, and, uh, you know, the house, the houses, um, you know, the once white flight happens and through these FHA red line maps, uh, Italians and Irish um, and their banks are able to integrate into the American economy where blacks are left behind purposefully so. I mean, the entire New Deal package was a compromise with white supremacy. FDR cannot pass his New Deal sort of, you know, democratic socialist reforms without the Southern Bloc in the Senate. And the Southern Bloc in the Senate is not about to let blacks become property owners and, you know, economically autonomous. They needed them to stay as the labor force in the South. So they forced, um, you know, the New Deal to have huge loopholes that exempt blacks from any protections. And, and what you're talking about here is really one of the um, greatest stories that haven't been told about the 20th century in America, uh, the story of how uh, middle, the, middle, the white middle class was created. It was through these FHA loans that allowed, and, and public housing, which was available largely to, to white Americans. It allowed working class whites to build wealth, to get subsidized housing when there was a huge housing shortage during the, the Great Depression and, and World War II get stable housing and then move to the suburbs, which, you know, today remain largely white and segregated. And while, and as you've noted, as white wealth was created, black poverty and segregation was also created specifically through government policy. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you, as you know, um, black banks were doomed to fail because they didn't have access to the same capital that white America had. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, I mean, to the extent that any American today has able to get middle class America, I'm leaving out billionaires here and, you know, uh, very, very poor in the bottom. But the large, you know, the middle, the American middle class is created through these New Deal programs. And these New Deal programs were explicitly uh, racial. And so white people who were, you know, factory workers, blue collar became middle class because they were able to own homes and go to colleges funded by federal programs. These programs were not available to blacks explicitly. So what that means is that your grandfather was able to get an FHA mortgage and that creates intergenerational wealth. And because your grandfather got that FHA mortgage, your grandmother, usually the father, and then your father was able to benefit from that, which means you know increased access to colleges, better schools, because the way our taxes work is the home, homeowner taxes go into the schools. And so it's this whole cycle of privilege that starts with these New Deal programs that, by the way, last well into the 1960s. Their effects are very much with us today. So the story of the 20, 20th century is, you know, W.E. Du Bois says this in the 30s, but he's much more, I think, prescient than he realized. But it's a story of the color line. And the color line is drawn by federal policy. And it's through the FHA Maps, the HOLC creates them in 1934, the FHA follows them, and the maps are, you know, that we're going to redline areas like Baltimore, 
like inner city Detroit, like Harlem, like South Chicago, no mortgages are given in these areas. And the one indicator that trumps all other indicators is the race of the neighborhood. And so if the neighborhood has mixed race, which meant blacks, they could not get mortgages. They were deemed to be highly risky. And so no banks would lend, even, even if outside of the FHA programs, banks were using these maps. So mortgages were not able to be um, uh, given in the ghetto. And then outside of the ghetto, and I'm, I'm using the word ghetto purposefully here because these were not sort of black communities that were self-selected into these areas. These were um, forced segre segregated communities. And so outside of those areas, blacks could not um, borrow or get loans there either because of the racial covenants. The racial covenants are put in by white homeowners associations mm -hmm. because they know that once blacks move into their neighborhoods, their property values decline as well. So it's very much an economic decision fueled by racism. So what this means for black banks uh, and for black individuals and families and communities is that they cannot accrue wealth because wealth is fueled by mortgages. But for those who can get mortgages, that wealth is able to sort of, you know, spiral into more wealth. You know, once you have a home mortgage, you're able to get a credit card. You pay less for everything. In, meanwhile, in the ghetto, if you're renting, credit card issuers won't come into the ghetto. And so you're paying installment credit for your TV, your um, hospital bills, your doctor. And what installment credit does is it deprives communities of the little wealth that they have. Installment credit is very expensive. It's uh, onerous. So, you know, we've got repo men and, um, you know, cops, everything just to buy a TV. And outside in the suburbs, it's a completely different credit market that um, develops based on these New Deal programs. And so this is the divergence that I track that still remains with us today. This is why you see in lower income black communities, more payday lenders, more check cashers. These are the areas where banks leave because they operate by different credit markets. What we've done is we've pooled the risk, the credit risk of, um, you know, that, that should be borne by all and diversified um, is just born in the ghetto. So those areas where there was the red lines put around them and largely black population within pay more for everything, for housing, for credit, um, for all of it. And then outside uh, is credit that's subsidized by the federal government. And it's essentially uh, very risk free. And so we know these redlining maps, um, you know, and, and extensions of that were government policy, but banks themselves are really an extension of the government. Can you talk about that as well? Because that's something that's not commonly understood or discussed. Yeah, so banks are, uh, and this is my, my area, and this mm -hmm. is why I came to uh, Black Banking, and the, the first book uh, goes into this in detail, but banks and governments are very much partners. I mean, look at what happens in 2008. The banks fail. And usually when businesses fail, they go bankrupt. But banks, because of the way that banks operate, we can't let them go bankrupt. Why? Because they use other people's money. So they use our deposits and our investments to make money. And because they're linked to the federal government through this monetary policy angle. So banks essentially, I mean, Louis Brandeis says in 1934, they look like public utilities, right? They're not private um, entities, look at where the credit is coming from. Their supply of credit comes through Federal Reserve policy decisions. The Federal Reserve is a government agency. Um, that money is the monetary supply that is fueled by the federal government. All of the credit infrastructure on which banks rely to lend is federal uh, policy. So the loans, the FHA loan guarantees, FDIC insurance is the way that keeps all of our deposits in these banks and a whole bunch of other federal programs that shore up the banking industry. So, you know, I don't even call it a federal subsidy. I mean, it's like calling the wheels to your car a bonus feature. Banks and governments need each other um, to operate. And so banks are very much public entities.